I will get there one day. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. Welcome to Eating Wild Honey and Locusts with your host, Jessica Knock. Today, it's my sheer privilege because I get the opportunity, the privilege and the honor to host Dr. Stephen Pigeon of Setha Publishing and Zen Garcia of Sacred World Publishing together. And we celebrate the things that they have in common, the relationship that they've been having for many years in speaking out as in voices and ambassadors, especially over this last couple of years uh, into our nation, into our situation for those who will hear and who will listen. So, you know, a wonderful joy to have you journey with us today and for us to be able to host Dr. Pigeon and Zen. So, you know, what I want to say about these two men, they share an equal passion where their work is largely influenced by the research of the lost hidden books, the forgotten books, the ancient manuscripts. And that's what I commend about both of them, because I know the price and I know the sacrifice and what it takes with their families, the intensity of study, actually the investment financially, the rejection uh, the what well, you know it's a hard and it's a lonely journey and they stood the test of time they continue to stand and do that the study of these extra canonical books and resources mainstream christendom they ignore it they condemn they exclude the modern scholar is simply there to scrutinize i've seen that you know if it's not in the 66 books of the authorized king james version they hold contempt to it so at the same time that both these gentlemen deliver such work to us they have to stand against these accusations and this spirit of condemnation all the time and that is hard i feel it just in the zone of the work that i do can you imagine when it's bringing the word how much harder that is. So we, I really do sense that privilege and the honor today for us just to sit and hear what they have to share with us. Both of them, I know with Zen, I was just saying to him, you know, he looks far younger than he is and he's not actually that old, but he started young, decades upon decades of research, careful study. I know from speaking with Stephen uh, in when we, he was back here in September, again, years and years, of just studying, learning Hebrew, brushing up on Hebrew, uh, visiting different countries, visiting the places, the sites, going through thousands to hundreds of manuscripts between both of them so that we can have an understanding of what they deliver today. And you're going to hear that. It's astounding, you know, the knowledge that they bring together. What I come to understand by working with Stephen and now getting into relationship with Zen is so much got lost in translation. And equally fascinating to that is the fact that when it was translated from Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Latin, English, more of those truths get broken down. They get lost for people to consider. And it's foolishness when they come with all these arguments saying this is why it can't be. There is no authority in it. These extra biblical books are just profound and they help us, my famous saying, navigating these times. You know, biblically, scripturally, in Matthew 24, verse 14, you know it so well. And the besorer of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations. And then the end shall come. And then the end shall come. Stephen and Zen, they will both tell you that we are in the end time and we are the end time generation, that we will see the closing of this age. And we need to become more knowledgeable of the times and the seasons and to study ourselves approved. That's what we're doing here today. We're studying ourselves approved like the Berean Jew. Another thing I commonly say so that we can understand all these ancient biblical teachings and draw on the fullness and the revelation that they present to us. You know, that's why in that beautiful book of First Enoch, chapter one, it says the word of blessing of Enoch, how the blessed are the elect and the righteous who were to exist in a time of trouble, rejecting all unrighteousness and the wicked. We are that generation. We are on that ones who are in the time of trouble. And this is even more affirmed in verse two. 
for then I heard all things and understood what I saw, that which will not take place in this generation, but in a generation which is to exceed at a distant period. We are that distant period and account on account of the elect. So today for your consideration, Zen Garcia and Dr. Stephen Pigeon are going to bring to your consideration, to your attention. And I've just been told perhaps for the first time uh, where a book has been written on the garments of the power and the rod of wonder of which Adam was banished from paradise. We're going to hear more and get the connections to that. There's so little, well, there's no mention of it outside of the 66 canon and very little maybe in uh, Genesis that can be brought into this about from biblical text. But it's intrinsic because it's connected to the kingship that led to the rise and the power of the patriarchs, the prophets in line of Adam and Cain, as well as going into the contention they had trying to empower one another. This is exciting because we're going to see the connections here today. We're going to start to see the connections, how these items prophetically, they are related to one another and how it brings out Revelation 19 verse 13, vestures dipped in blood and the rod of iron, which Messiah will flaunt when returning to judge the world at the end of the days. Those type of things, you know, for me personally, they excite me. So I just want to read to you the blurb at the back of Zen's book is the vestures, the light and rod of wonder. And it says this, and it's available on his website for the UK. Uh, you can get it directly uh, from Amazon as well, but it's always better to go straight to Zen's site if you can. So it says, this is interwoven into the story of Adam and Eve's fall from grace, an account of the garments of power made to clothe them by Yahuwah when exciting, exiling them from paradise. Another aspect of the tale alludes to the limb which Adam carried forth from the tree of life, which in letter scripture is described as the rod of wonder or staff of miracles given to Moshe by Jethro when marrying Zephora. Moshe utilized the stave in paving the reed sea and bringing forth from the desert stone the waters which satisfied the thirst of Israel during their wandering. In this book, he will trace the history of those two items throughout the lives of the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles of Israel, and share with the reader their supernatural importance in accomplishing facts little realized by mainstream Christianity. So we really are in for something today. And with that, I'm going to bring Dr. Pigeon and Zen Garcia uh, here right now. So let me bring Zen in for first. Zen. Wonderful to have you here today. An absolute pleasure and honor, like I've said so many times, but we are excited. We really are. Uh, it's a very great honor for me to be here with all of you, especially with Dr. Pigeon, who uh, I've had a long time relationship with and enjoy doing this kind of work. Um, but especially to also speak about the subject matter, which is at hand. I had a long time ago heard of about uh, a show that Dr. Pigeon had done on the uh, staff of Aaron and the supernatural aspects of that particular staff, as he mentioned in this work. And it was a, a very long broadcast that covered a, a <laughs> number of different topics. And But, it, it you know, that staff is in association with the story of the one that I cover in this particular manuscript. Mm -hmm. And that is specific to the uh, one that Adam was given when removed from paradise and ex exiled and banished here to this world. And this is also that one that, uh, as I said, Moshe had utilized to split the Reed Sea when they were finding deliverance from the armies of Pharaoh that were in chase uh, wow. and trying to slaughter them. And so... Uh, Dr. Pigeon, I'll give you a chance to to comment. Um, yeah, let me bring him on. Go on, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say because um, I'm sure that in reading the extra biblical materials, he has run on passages that um, mention these items, but I, I don't know of a book or 
any other account out there which puts it together in the fullness that I do within this manuscript. And so uh, we'll we'll go through some elaboration when I bring out the ancient sources connected to this particular story. Okay, let me bring Stephen on. I want to say uh, good afternoon to you, Zen. It is good to join you again in uh, this kind of a conference, you know, being isolated here in an undisclosed location in the Alaskan wilderness has <laughs> kind of left me out of, uh, you know, participation events, if you will. And um, we used to call show and tell when I was in elementary school. But I have to say, uh, brother, that this is, you know, I'm just I'm having a chance to go through your manuscript for the first time here today. And uh, some of the discussion on the garments is just really outstanding. And of course, it pieces together many of these elements that we are discovering. And I, and I just kind of want to make this point um, to the viewers that when we do research like we do on the dig, you know, we're looking to find things in existence that are not contradictory to scripture. And for those people who uh, support the idea of a 66 book, a canon, uh, which in, in my opinion is a very, very limited view and inconsistent with even the traditional practices of, of Christianity and churchianity over the last 2000 years, totally inconsistent. We see that, of course, the Catholic Church canonized the Apocrypha, King James authorized version publishes the Apocrypha the 1539 Great Bible of Coverdale published the Apocrypha, the 1560 John Calvin Geneva Bible published the Apocrypha, even the Brown 1854 edition of the English text of Scripture published the Apocrypha. Only the editors after 1880 believed that they could sell as many books without the Apocrypha as with it did we see the Apocrypha disappear. And most people who claim to be King James Version only are reading a redacted, revised, rescripted, reparagraphed, rescrivenered text that they claim to be the authorized version. And it simply is not. And you can download a free copy of the KJV AV online all, all day long and see for yourself how much your King James in your hands has been altered from what was published in 1611. But with that being said, we know that we, we do view things from a factual point of view. First of all, is there any contradiction with the 66 book canon? That's premise number one. And if there is contradiction, well, then maybe it's suspect. Next, next question is, is it contradictory to the complete canon, which includes all the apocrypha? If it is, then it may be suspect. And so what we tried to find is we tried to find what is actually being said in scripture. Now, some of the difficulties that we've run into, and this is a big problem for many people, is that the English text oftentimes does not comport at all with the Hebrew text. It's disparate. It's weird. And there have been changes made because, first of all, I think there was a real bias inside uh, Britain at the time the English texts were made towards capital punishment. I mean, they were hanging people right and left and, and hanging was the gentle form of capital punishment. Oftentimes people were drawn and quartered. You know, um, we watched a movie last night on Robert the Bruce, Stephanie and I did on Robert the Bruce and his work in the 14th century. Well, this is about 200 years before King James would arrive, excuse me, Henry VIII would arrive. So who was Robert the Bruce at war with anyway? You know, when you watch Braveheart, you see William Wallace fighting against the wicked English kings. But the wicked English kings that uh, William Wallace was resisting, and the same that Robert the Bruce were resisting, were actual puppets of the papacy. They were there to expand the control of Rome and as Zen has pointed out in his new book, that these garments that were stolen by Ham, by Ham and his children, the garments of Adam and Eve that were stolen, given to Nimrod, that this has placed a supervisory power over the world by the children of the serpent. 
And you can have little question that the serpent's representative, <clears throat> that its uh, chief priest on earth is the Pope, because he sits in an audience hall that is in the shape of the serpent's head. I mean, I don't think you need anything more right. obvious than that, that it is the cult of the serpent and that the cult of the serpent sought to expand itself over all of Europe. And so the armies that were warring against William Wallace, Edward I, and Edward II, who were warring, uh, warring against Robert the Bruce, who Robert the Bruce defeated, by the way, these were all agents of Rome, descendants of William the Conqueror, who were there to push the power and the political authority of Rome over the British Isles. And Robert the Bruce was defending what was left of the Gaelic tradition, the sons of Zarach in the British Isles who had rebuilt Jerusalem initially at Tara Hill, which would move to Scone in Scotland under the hand of Robert the Bruce. And I had the privilege of being at the Abbey. You know, Robert the Bruce never built a palace or a castle for himself. And so he is buried in an abbey in a Dem Fernline uh, there in uh, in Scotland across the Firth of Forth. We had the honor and the privilege of being able to go near the grave of uh, Robert the Bruce, the great king who fought on behalf of the Gaelic people in a great stand against the rise of Roman hegemony over the British Isles. So when we look at this rod of, of Aaron, however, these were things that we discovered surreptitiously in doing our research, trying to transliterate names. So we had made a decision, uh, you know, at the, at, at the impetus of the Ruach HaKodesh, who had said, you need to straighten these things out because there is so much lost in the English by losing the names. And by transliterating the names, all of a sudden you will discover the meaning of the names. And by discovering the meaning of the names, so much of scripture will come alive to you. Now, it was in this impetus that we found the name Yawa. It was in this impetus that we found the name Yahusha. It was this impetus we found the name Yeshayahu for Isaiah and Yermiyahu for Jeremiah and Yekezkel for Ezekiel. And all of these names began to show themselves. And so we continued on our research. And as we began to look, I, I needed to look at one particular passage in Genesis. And this was the passage where, no, excuse me, it's in Exodus. Where, this is the passage when Yah told Moshe, these people are being bit by serpents. Well, why were they being bit by serpents? I mean, this is one question that you have to ask yourself. They were being bitten, bitten by adders. Well, the reason they were being bit is because of their sin. That's why they were being bit. And so they were being bit, and Yah goes to Moshe, and he says, Moshe, put a seraph on a banner. Well, what's a seraph? Now, this is a question. Now, Strong's will tell you, oh, that's a fiery serpent. Where did they get that definition? We have two examples in scripture, that is to say two witnesses testifying that the seraph is the singular of seraphim. There's actually three witnesses if you want to know the truth of it. There is Isaiah who saw them. There is John the Revelator who saw them. And Yekezkel, Ezekiel himself, saw them when the chariots came before him. If you read closely that description, you'll see he's describing a six-winged angel, not a four-winged angel. Similarly, Isaiah is, describes a six-winged seraph, and Ezekiel, excuse me, John the Revelator, describes a six-winged seraph. And he says their wings were covered with eyes. Well, think of the peacock wings. Think of the peacock wings and how the peacock is covered with eyes. These, similarly, were the eyes that are on the wings of these seraphs. And then he explains that these seraphs supernaturally, well, spiritually, rather, is a better way to put it, they have four heads, right? They have the man, they have the lion, uh, and they have the bull, and they have the eagle. These four heads are on these seraphs. Now, does it say that all four heads are on a single one? No. Each seraph had a different head. All right. So Moshe was supposed to put the image of a six-winged seraph on a banner. But Moshe 
as he did when he was at, at Mount Horeb, when he was told to speak to the rock, he took the staff instead and struck the rock twice. This resulted in him being deprived of entry into the Holy Land. You're not going in, Moshe. You're not going in because you had asserted your authority over Yah, just as he did in taking his rod and placing a brazen serpent atop it. He placed a brazen serpent atop his rod to proclaim his authority. When Yah had told him to put a seraph on a banner, he put a brass serpent on a pole. Now, even though this was uh, uh, very symbolic as to what would happen with Mashiach, because as the book of uh, the Wisdom of Solomon says, the reason you would look up to the serpent and be healed is not because there was a serpent on the end of the staff, but that you would be looking up to him who was lifted up onto the staff and crucified as your salvation. And so it has nothing to do with the staff, but rather the authority of Yah. But nonetheless, the authority of Yah was to be expressed in a seraph. So I began looking at these things much closer. And as I began to look at the staff, we begin to come together with something. Okay, now wait a minute. There's something interesting happening here. Because Moshe was given his sign of authority in his staff. So Yah says, so Moshe says, look, you can't send me. I've got, uh, you know, I got an injury in my mouth. I talk weird. I kind of talk like this. And, it, it, it's pretty, and my voice is hoarse as a result. And Yah says, look, I picked you. Shut up and go do it. Uh, you know, excuse, excuse. Okay, fine. I'll get your brother who speaks very well, and he could be the mouthpiece. Oh, okay. And so two different rods are given. Aaron has a rod, Aharon has a rod, and Moshe has a rod. Yeah, was it copper or bronze? Well, uh, Sanadria, this is a good question. But when you look at the copper or bronze, it's basically, I mean, bronze is copper. Bronze is copper and tin. It's a copper and tin alloy. And we know, and now that you've asked that question, we know the tin was being imported into Egypt to, to make the bronze fixtures as early as 1500 BC. Okay, so before Moshe left. But okay, so going back to this, I'm looking at Aharon's rod. And here you have Moshe casting down his rod. And, and Yah says, well, look, I'll give you a symbol of authority. Take your, the staff that's in your hand, throw it on the ground. He throws it on the ground. And it becomes a serpent. And Moshe, hey, I can, you know, probably a cobra. I can, you know, hey, I got to get out of here. Yah says, no, grab it by the tail. He grabs it by the tail. It becomes a staff again. And he picks it back up. But Aharon, on the other hand, when he casts down his staff, it becomes Tanin, a dragon. It becomes a dragon. Mm -hmm. Now, so when I discovered that Aharon's rod became a dragon, this was something else. So I went back and started looking at the appearance of the term dragon throughout scripture. And there it is, Tanin or Tanim. It appears many, many places throughout the Old Testament, in particular Moshe's Tanakh. So we see that dragons, and, and I think these are something more than a Komodo dragon. These are these were dragon dragons, dragons. And uh, so this becomes very significant. Now, this rod of Aharon, and Zen is going to talk about it a lot more because he's got a lot more research on it from additional sources, talking about what happened with the rod, where it came from, its source initially, how it ended up with the brothers, but it's so interesting because when you get in the book of Numbers, you see that Moshe comes to the tribes and he says, okay, you guys, I want you to take a, a rod and I want you to carve the name of your tribe on that rod and then affix a banner. And he does this to all the tribes except the tribe of Levi. And there's no rod that says Levi on it. Instead, they use the rod of Aharon to mark the tribe of, of Levi. They use the rod of Aharon to mark the tribe of Levi. Now, these rods, in addition to having their names on them, they also had their banners, the banners for each of the tribes of Israel. And there were four groups. <clears throat> and the four groups were amassed under Judah, whose banner was the lion, Ephraim, whose banner was the man, excuse me, whose banner was the ox, Dan, whose banner was the eagle, 
And I believe, what was it, Issachar? I don't remember who the last one was, whose banner was the man. So the four heads you see on the seraphim are the four heads of the four groupings of the tribes in the wilderness, who, by the way, when they laid out their configuration, created a gigantic cross in the wilderness facing east. <coughs> this is what is seen in the book of Numbers in chapter 2. So this rod of Aharon is the rod that is placed in the Ark of the Covenant, along with the ten Devarim, and along with manna that would survive forever. And this Ark of the Covenant then appears in Jerusalem with David. But the question becomes, what happened to the rod? When Solomon op opens the Ark, he finds the ten Devarim on the blue sapphire, but he does not find the rod. What happened to the rod? Well, Psalm 23 is a clue. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me, says David. Now, I'm of the conviction, and I'm, I want Zen to speak to this from here, but I'm of the conviction that this rod became the symbol of authority in the hands of the kings of Yasharel. Remember that in Genesis 49, the, the blessing that is given on Judah is you shall have a scepter in your hand and a lawgiver between your feet and you shall rule over your brethren. A prophecy of the coming Mashiach to be certain in the line of David. Isaiah 11.1 1 also prophesies a stem will grow out of the root of Jesse and a government will be upon his shoulders, right? So we see that the, the tribe of Judah is forever going to have the kingship. But there's also a promise that the king the kingship in the line of David would never end. Now, this is excluding the kingdom of Yahusha, who is a kingdom that is not of this world. The kingdom of this world will have the line of David. And it is marked by this rod of Aharon. However, and I'm trying to summarize this as quickly as I can, and I want to turn the floor over to you. However, when you look at uh, what happened with Manasseh, the most wicked, evil king in the history of Yasharel, his wickedness, not unlike the wickedness we see in the United States today, although I think we superseded Nasha two days ago with the Grammy Awards and open satanic festivals on stage in Hollywood. I think we succeeded Manasha's wickedness. We have arrived at the most wicked nation as the most wicked nation on earth now. The, the most wicked nation on earth. Nonetheless, going back to Manasha, Manasha erected a five-headed god. He put up the, the the temples for the high places. He worshipped Baal. He worshipped Molech. He sacrificed his own children to Molech. He had multiple wives. They worshipped Dagon. They worshipped Ishtar. They worshipped all the demons and the false gods. And he refused to acquiesce or to circumcise the heart to Yahweh. To Yahweh. So as a result, what happens? He is cursed. And the only thing that stops the curse on the house of Yasharel is Yoshiyahu, who repents, finds the Torah, and takes down all the hard places. And Yah speaks to Yoshiyahu and says, Yoshiyahu, listen, I am going to destroy Jerusalem, and I'm going to destroy this kingdom. Not in your time, because you have sought righteousness. But in the time of your sons, who will return to the wickedness of Manasseh. And sure enough, that's exactly what Yekonyahu did. He went right back and right back and started certain ways of Manasseh. And when he did, Nebuchadnezzar came and took Yekonyahu captive to Babylon. Now, there's scriptural support that says, well, what about Joachim and Joachim and Zedekiah, other kings that are not listed in Matthew 1? They did not have the rod of Aharon. The rod of Aharon was in the hands of Yekonyahu, who was in, who was in Babylon. So when Yekonyahu dies, this rod is passed to the kings in exile. They call it the exile arc, the exile arc. And this exile archy, these kings who were in exile, is a continuous stream from Shealtiel through Zerubbabel all the way to Joseph of Arimathea, the father of Miriam, the mother of Mashiach. So it is my contention that the rod of Aharon remained in the hand of Joseph of Arimathea. What he did with that rod, I believe he brought it to the British Isles. When he came to the British Isles, not only with Miriam, but also her sister Anna, and also was there, and, and Miriam's mother was likely born in Britain, in Cornwall to be exact. 
so we see that we've got a very interesting situation happening here in terms of what happened with the rod of Aaron. Now, where is the rod of Aharon today? I don't know, but I can tell you the, the Welsh flag that was created in 1959 by Queen Elizabeth, by the way, the Welsh flag with the dragon on the flag, this was not always the Welsh flag. This Welsh flag was created by Queen Elizabeth in 1959. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you, Marty. Of, of Ted Cruz, Senator Cruz said it was pure evil. It's nothing but evil. It is absolute satanic wickedness at the highest possible level. And, you know, you don't have to have a, a, a human sacrifice on stage for it to reach an idolatry that is absolutely reprehensible to Yah, that is pure blasphemy in the face of Yah, that is wickedness beyond anything you could imagine. And I can tell you, it is a certainty that because of that festival, which was embraced by Hollywood and widely accepted in the American culture, that the United States will be destroyed. Let it be said here and let it be said concisely, completely, and so that no one has any misunderstanding. The United States of America, that culture, that nation state is going to be completely destroyed. It is going to be a hissing and a byword among all the nations. All right. I'm going to leave it at that. And uh, so, sorry, sorry about getting, I'm getting worked up on my own words. <laughs> ridiculous. Okay. But uh, anyway, um, so let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back to Zen's fantastic book here. Uh, well, thank you, Doctor Pigeon, for sharing that information. And I do absolutely believe that you are correct in regard to not only the garments of skin, but also um, the the rod of wonder and Aaron's rod, um, and that it was passed down through the lineages, and that the generations of the children um, of Adam as they were initiated into the Melchizedek priesthood and the order of the ancients that we find this information scattered throughout the extra biblical manuscripts. And that this is something, uh, as we talked about at the very beginning of the show, that if you are one of those that is only uh, King James scholar and you will only read those particular manuscripts and especially the shortened version which excludes even the apocrypha this is a, uh, a a subject matter that does not reveal itself or come to light in much of the uh the general gospel the authorized manuscripts but when you begin again to look at and to consider the extra biblical material, then you are given these hints and you receive uh, these moments of elucidation, which help you to then piece together the larger story of what we are alluding to and what we are talking about here. And so I will start with uh, on that account something that we find in the book of Jasher um, that is specific to this. And then I'll go back a little bit further and explain some other details. But I just wanted to start with the canonical materials to show people that this is there one, as long as you're reading you know, the Apocrypha that is not excluded um, and that you can find this in many other of the uh, materials as well but um i'll just start with that and then the another quote from the legends of the jews just to set up this particular story and it says and the garments of skin which god made for adam and his wife when they went out of the garden were given to cush for after the death of adam and his wife the garments were given to Enoch, the son of Yared. And when Enoch was taken up to God, he gave them to Methuselah, his son. And at the death of Methuselah, Noah took them and brought them to the ark. And they were with him until he went out of the ark. 
And in their going out, Ham stole those garments from Noah, his father, and he took them and he hid them from his brothers. And when Ham begat his firstborn, Cush, he gave him the garments in secret. And when Cush had begotten Nimrod, he gave him those garments through his love for him. And Nimrod grew up, and when he was 20 years old, he put on those garments. And Nimrod became strong when he put on the garments, and God gave him might and strength. And he was a mighty hunter in the earth. Yea, he was a mighty hunter in the field. And he hunted the animals, and he built altars, and he offered upon them the animals before the Lord. And Nimrod strengthened himself, and he rose up from amongst his brethren, and he fought the battles of his brethren against all their enemies round about. And it goes even further into how he was, you know, able to become really the tyrant of the entire New World Order at that time, uh, that the Tower of Babel and the actions and the establishment of that whole effort was like a New World Order that we are in this day contending against uh, this world government, this global domination. But I'll read this other passage from the Legends of the Jews and then go into a, a couple of prophecies that are linked to this because as Dr. Pigeon also spoke about uh, very eloquently at the beginning of this show is that the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, that this backing forth, the vying for power and control over one another, that this happened over time and that the Most High allowed um, the two different factions, the two different groups, the children of the devil and the children of Adam to come to power at different times according to what was the prophecy of this enmity that would be waged and that would play out all throughout time until the return of the Messiah and the second advent. Because it was declared in the parable of the tares of the field to allow both the wheat and the tares to grow together until the time of the end. And so they were not wiped out fully during the time of the flood of Noah's day. And that they found continuance and that this continuance is also mentioned and spoken about in other manuscripts, uh, which we will at some point um, go into as well but another passage let's and, talk about that for just a second because that yeah really sure is part of the book here that you're relating because we see noah and his two wives naama and uh this is a very interesting uh a very interesting aspect because when we look at the line of cain for just a minute if we don't if you don't mind exploring that no no book, please when you look at the line of Cain, the line of Cain comes to an end in its Y DNA, if you will, with Tubal Cain. And Tubal Cain, who is traveling with his father, it's very interesting how Genesis gives us a very cryptic comment about what takes place. Right. But that is very well revealed in, I think it's in the book of Jasher, when we see that he's Lemech is traveling with uh, is traveling with Tubal Cain. And Tubal Cain, by the way, is the eighth from Cain. So remember that Cain had a mark on him that said, you know, seven times, you know, they will not, they will not, you know, they will not be able to kill you seven times. And that is kind of indicative that he would be, he would see seven generations before his death. So Lemech right. is the seventh generation. Then we get to Tubal Cain, and Tubal Cain is the eighth. And he's hunting with Lemech, and he says, Oh, look, there's a deer. And Lemech shoots the arrow. 
And according to at least one legend, he kills Cain. And he kills Cain with the arrow. And when he kills Cain with the arrow, he's so outraged, he beats Tubal Cain to death. And so when you read the when you read the litany in Genesis, it has a very cryptic saying about how he felt bad about what he had done or something to, to that effect. But at any rate, mm-hmm. you see that the line of Cain, the Y DNA comes to an end. But Tubal Cain's sister, Naama, would end up on the ark. And she ends up on the ark as the mother of Ham. Right. And because of this, so we see Shem and Yefet coming from a pure DNA in Naama, the first wife. Naama, the first wife. Shem and Yefet come from a, uh, a clean line of, let's call it 144,000 gene uh, double helix DNA. But then we see a different DNA appearing in Naama through, a, once again, it's the seed of the woman transiting a Y DNA to the sun that is coming from a different line. And so a different helix appears and is retained upon the ark. So it should not be of any surprise that it would be the children of Ham that would steal the the garments. That should not be a surprise, right? Because, and once again, we see this idea of trying to steal the earth from Yah's creation, trying to steal the uh, trying to steal uh, the throne from Judah. Esau has been doing that as, you know, the, the, for the last 2000 years, uh, well, 2500 years trying to steal the throne or the, the scepter from Judah and the lawgiver from between his feet. And so this has been an ongoing process, but I just wanted to demonstrate when we look at that when we see closely about how Jasher delineates that particular circumstance we see that there is a different seed that transits through the deluge. Now, in addition to that, this thing I was pointing out in the ancient days class, when you see the curse that comes upon the watchers and their children, that they shall be cast into the earth until the time of judgment. The watchers didn't die in the deluge. They didn't die in the deluge. They have been preserved in the earth. They're there even now, even as we speak. So this is something that we, you know, that we need also that we also need to consider. But when we talk about this idea that the line would continue, we see in Numbers 1333, Anach and the Anakim, Anach and his children giving birth, he was giving birth to giants. And this is the source that later, later produced, you know, a Goliath and so on. Okay, so I turn it back to you. I just wanted to kind of bring that out for a second. Yeah, no, really, really good point. I'm glad that you brought that up. And after I read this particular passage, I will go into another that uh, confirms exactly what you were expressing there. And this is something that I also cover in this work because the nakedness of the father is very important. Uh, and suggestive to how the bloodline and the lineages continue and also why Canaan uh, was cursed um, and and that it wasn't Ham that was cursed by Noah, but that Canaan, and he would also be the usurper of the lands of Shem and also of what became ancient Israel. And so that was um, part of the prophecy in the, covenant with Abraham was a restoration of the possession of that land. Um, So we'll continue. It says, he gave him the clothes made of skins. And so this is a confirming witness to what I had said initially, but we'll go into with, you know, it gives different details. He gave him the clothes made of skins with which God had furnished Adam and Eve at the time of their leaving paradise. Cush himself had gained possession of them through Ham. From Adam and Eve they had descended to Enoch, and from him to Methuselah and to Noah, and the last had taken them with him into the ark. When the inmates of the ark were about to leave their refuge, Ham stole the garments and kept them concealed, finally passing them on to his firstborn son Cush. Cush in turn hid them, 
for many years. And when his son Nimrod reached his 20th year, he gave them to him. These garments had a wonderful property. He who wore them was both invincible and irresistible. The beasts and the birds of the woods fell down before Nimrod as soon as they caught sight of him, arrayed in them, and he was equally victorious in his combats with men. The source of this unconquerable strength was not known to them. They attributed it to his personal prowess, and therefore they appointed him king over themselves. This was done after a conflict between the descendants of Cush and the descendants of Japheth, from which Nimrod emerged triumphant. Having rooted the enemy utterly with the assistance of just a handful of warriors, he chose Shinar as his capital, and thence he extended his dominion farther and farther until he rose by cunning and forced to be the sole ruler of the whole world. The first mortal to hold universal sway as the ninth ruler to possess the same power will be the Messiah. This last portion of this passage, as the ninth ruler to possess the same power will be the Messiah, is very important in what is called the Ten King Prophecy because it shows how the bloodlines vying against one another that at different times in the generations of humanity, the world would be ruled over by, in the case of Nimrod, the seed of the serpent. And in the case of David and Solomon, you know, the seed of the woman. And also that Messiah would be the stem of Jesse that came in Revelation 19, 13. He would be wearing this vesture dipped in blood and wielding this rod of iron, which the vesture dipped in blood is this garment of power that was given to uh, Joseph by his father. And that is the the vesture that the brothers ripped up and dipped into the kid's blood to betray as if uh, he had been killed and that he becomes ruler in Egypt. And that whole story is part of this legacy as well. Uh, Dr. Pigeon, did you want to comment? It's just so fascinating. You know, Jasher relates such a beautiful story on that because the brothers and, you know, and it was Judah's idea to kill Joseph and Reuben's right. idea is let's don't kill him. Let's just throw him in the pit. And then he was going to later rescue him. But Judah wanted to kill him. And right. Judah had no concept. You know, you can just see the arrogance of a young man uh, who has no idea of the consequences of his action in killing his brother, Joseph, what that was going to do to his father. And exactly. when they were they returned with the with the bloodstained garment and oh, this is what's left dad he must have got eaten by a by an animal right right and yakov was he was incapable of being comforted i mean it was impossible his life had been completely destroyed he was decimated he was completely mm. wiped out and then if you recall they bring in the wolf in the book of jasher there's a remarkable story they bring in the wolf she wolf this is the wolf that we think killed your son. And he's like, mm, no, I don't think so. And as he decides that the wolf is not who killed his son, Joseph, the wolf looks at him and says, I too am looking for my son. Right. And which just, it's absolutely a remarkable passage. You know, you might say a talking wolf, you know, who's ever heard of a talking mm -hmm. wolf? Well, who's ever heard of a talking donkey, right? That goes on in right. scripture to Tanakh, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. So we can have a talking donkey to Balaam. We can sure we can sure have a talking wolf to Yaakov. And but the but the symbology there, particularly when you're talking about Benjamin, right? Benjamin, this 
this idea. Mm-hmm. I mean, Benjamin, I think, I think was alive at this point. Raquel was already dead. And here's this wolf. I too am looking for my lost son. Very much a metaphor for what had happened with, uh, with Benjamin, you know, and so forth. Anyway, it's a remarkable passage of loss and suffering. But yeah, and in that, when we talk about that, uh, the coat of many colors that was given to Joseph, this is right. something else, too, because, you know, when you look at this, this uh, in, in the Hebrew, you know, this katonet uh, ras, right? And But it, it's in the plural, rasim. So we see that it is a, a, a garment, like unlike Mashiach's garment, which had no seams, Mashiach's garment was seamless. This means that it was wove or, or, or weaved it was uh it was weaved from a single concept a single thread had weaved this entire garment so an extremely expensive robe to have been weaved in that respect but joseph garment was made of multiple seams many people believe it was 12 seams it could have been more than that 13 seams you know that showed the 12 tribes of israel but because it was multiple seamed it's believed to have been of multiple colors. Now, what were the colors? Were they just gray and white, yellow, off-white, ivory white, etc.? Or were they the colors that were found in the ephod that there was yes. worn by the priest? You know, and right. its symbology has you know many many meanings too. That that coat of many colors, expressing the idea of Yosef having rulership over many many nations, many kingdoms, right? Anyway, I'll, I'll, right. I'll let me turn it back to you at this point here, Zen. Yeah, all that is very important. And yes, um, you know, because it was after it was in Egypt when Benjamin was united with his brothers and they were all there before him and that he wept. Uh, he finally saw the the prophecy of his dream and that the 11 stars, you know, would all bow before him and that he had had that dream since he was very young and took a lot of criticism and hatred and uh, animosity from the other brothers, especially Judah, as you said, um, because of having dreamt that dream. But it was a fulfillment of that, and it all came to play out then. But uh, let me continue with the, um, specifically with the seed of Cain being spared through what was the flood. Uh, And this also talks about and shows us that the children of Cain, they were excluded from the priesthood and that they were not able to uh, involve themselves or to be um, prophets for the Most High. And that they were also involved in the secret societies uh, that, you know, they were doing the other side of it, the Freemasonic, the uh, the holding and passing on their own traditions in that different manner. But this is from the writings of Abraham, which is a little known text, but goes into this in great detail. It says, And when Noah was 450 years old, he begat a son and he called his name Japheth. 42 years later, he begat another son of her who was the mother of Japheth, and he called his name Shem. Eight years later, Noah begat a son of his wife, Nama, who was of the seed of Cain, and he called his name Ham. For he said, through him will the curse be preserved in the land. Now, Noah had taken a wife of the seed of Cain, and she was a righteous woman. Nevertheless, the curse remained with her seed, according to the word of God. And Noah took her on this wise. For the word of the Lord came unto Noah, saying, Take unto thyself Nama, the daughter of Lamech, who dwelleth here in the city of thy fathers. For she hath been faithful to my gospel. Wherefore I shall preserve through her the seed of Cain through the flood. This Lamech, who was the father of Nama, was of the seed of Cain, being the son of Methusael, the son of Mahujael, 
the son of Irat, the son of Enoch, the son of Cain. Lamech had married Ada and Zillah, the daughters of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam. Ada bare children unto Lamech, but Zillah was barren until her old age, when the Lord opened up her womb, and she conceived, and bare a son and a daughter. Her son she named Tubal Cain, saying, After I had withered away, have I attained him from the Almighty God. Her daughter she named Nama, saying, After I have withered away, have I obtained pleasure and delight. While Nama was yet a child, great consternation fell upon the seed of Cain. For Irad, the son of Enoch, the son of Cain, had become a member of the secret combination and was privy to all of its secrets until one night when the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Irad, thou hast done evil instead of good and hast followed after Satan rather than God. Wherefore I shall destroy thee and thine house when I send in the floods upon the earth. But Irad was pricked in his heart and pled with the Lord to show mercy and to preserve his seed through the great flood. Seeing that his penitence was true, the Lord said to him, Irad, if thou wilt repent and will reveal the secrets of the secret combination unto the sons of Seth, I will have mercy upon thee, and I will join thy seed unto the seed of Seth, that it may be preserved through the great flood. Wherefore, Irad went forth and began to reveal these secrets to the son of the sons of Cain unto the sons of Seth. Lamech, being a maester mahan at that time, found Irad sitting in his garden with Joram, the young son of Irad, and he slew him. And thus Lamech slew Irad for the sake of the oath of the secret combinations, and he slew Irad's son with him. But Tubal Cain, the son of Lamech, had followed him and viewed his evil deed. And when he had committed, he revealed it unto his mother, Zillah, and she unto her sister, Ada. Wherefore, Ada and Zillah confronted Lamech with his evil and cursed him in the name of the Lord for having slain Irad, who had repented of his wickedness from among the sons of men. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech shall be seventy and seventyfold. Lamech's wives, therefore, feared to confront him further, but Lamech repented not of his evil deeds, and finding his son Tubal Cain at prayer, he slew him for having revealed these murders. And when Ada and Zillah, the wives of Lamech, learned of this, they took their remaining sons and daughters and went unto their father Canaan, Canaan's city, and revealed the remainder of the secrets of this evil combination among the sons of Adam. Thus did Nama come to dwell among the sons of Adam, and she grew up before the Lord in righteousness and was known for her tender care toward the sick and the unfortunate. Nevertheless, 
she had not husband because she was of the forbidden race. When the word of the Lord came unto Noah, saying, Take unto thyself Nama, the daughter of Lamech, who dwelleth here in the city of thy fathers, for she hath been faithful to my gospel, wherefore I shall preserve through her the seed of Cain through the flood. Noah went unto his father, Methuselah. Methuselah inquired of the Lord and returned this word unto his son, Lamech. Verily thus saith the Lord, Mine handmaiden, Nama, have I given unto my son Noah, that the seed of Cain might be preserved through the great flood, which I will send upon the earth. Wherefore, let not my son Noah fear to take her to wife, for in so doing he shall be blessed, for through him will come all nations. Wherefore say unto him, Noah, my son, I have looked upon the evils of the sons of men, which have come up before me, for they have corrupted the whole earth, save only this city in which thou dwellest. Therefore, I will send in the floods upon the earth, but thou and thy seed will I preserve through the flood. For I will send mine angels to instruct thee in the building of an ark, wherein ye shall be saved. Behold, I shall establish thy seed before me forever, and I will spread them abroad over the earth, as numerous as the sand upon the seashore. Thy seed shall not cease as long as the earth shall stand, but through thee and thy priesthood, which will be preserved in thy seed, shall all nations be blessed. And when Lamech returned this word to his son, Noah rejoiced and praised the Lord, saying, I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, for thou hast been unto me a strong wall against all that would seek my destruction. Yea, thou hast promised to shelter me from the disasters which are coming upon the earth, that the floods shall not come in upon me to destroy my seed from the earth. Thou hast set my foot upon a rock, that the sons of men shall not prevail against me. And yea, I will walk in the way yeah. of the ancients. In the past which thou hast appointed, will I spend my days, for thou art my shield and my deliverer. And in thee will I trust all the days of my life. Amen. And thus did Noah take the wife Nama, Nama, the daughter of Zillah, the wife of Lamech, of the seed of Cain. And she bare him a son, whom he named Ham. And thus was the curse preserved in the land through the great flood. For when the patience of God was ended, in which he did grant the space of time for repentance upon the sons of men, the floods came in upon the earth and destroyed all flesh from off the face of the earth, save eight souls only. For Noah and his youngest wife, Ada, and his three sons, Shem, Japheth, and Ham, and one of each of their wives were preserved in the ark, which the angels had instructed Noah in building. The remainder of the righteous had died or been caught up into Enoch city prior to the time of the flood, and these eight were saved. The writings of Abraham, chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. And so... Yeah, remarkable, remarkable, Zen. And if you don't mind, yes. let me just a couple of things on that. So yeah, please. For, if you don't know, let's take a look at Genesis 4. 
Genesis 4, and this is 419, where it reads in most people's scripture, and Lamech, now Lamech here we're talking about in the line of Cain. We're not talking about the Lamech that's in the line of uh, Seth through uh, to Noah. We're talking about in the line of right. Cain. And Lamech took unto him two women. The name of one was Ada, and the other was Zillah, which confirms your writing. And Ada, born Yaval, he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and as such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Yuval, and he was the father as all such as handled the harp and the flute. Now, this tells you something about harpist and flutist. They're all of the children of Cain. No, I'm, ju I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> and Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. So here we see brass, which is again an alloy, iron, which is again an alloy, that was being done here before the flood. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. And Lamech said unto his woman, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye women of Lamech, and hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. Okay, this confirms exactly what you were saying that he confessed to his wives that he was twice a murderer, right? Right, right. And if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. All right, now if the vengeance of Cain was sevenfold, what we see in when you count up these generations from Cain to Lamech, that's exactly seven generations. Tubal Cain is the eighth generation, and he is slain. But now we see Lemek said, well, I'm going to be avenged 70 times. Now, if you take a look at Enoch, chapter 10, Hanok, chapter 10, beginning in verse 15, we see this phrase. To Micaiah, likewise, Yahweh said, go and announce his crime to Shemiyatza and the others who are with him who have been associated with women, that they might be polluted with all their impurity. And when all their sons shall be slain, when they shall see the perdition of their beloved, bind them for 70 generations underneath the earth, even unto the day of judgment and of consummation, until the judgment, the effect of which will last forever be completed. So here we see that the line of Lamech, this idea of having a 70-fold vengeance in the line of Lamech, if we compare it to generations, we see Cain had seven generations, but Lamech would have 70 generations, and it's reiterated here again in the book of Hanok, saying this seed is going to last for 70 generations, right? And yes. so that's, that's what I'm buying out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that, again, is confirming witness to the sentence that was revealed. And also that uh, Cain would be preserved to be um, killed by one of his own bloodline, and that Lamech would be the one to fulfill that prophecy. And so, indeed, yeah. this is how it played out. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. I wanted to share one other thing, because I know that we're quickly coming up on the end of the show, and that when we do the next one on this series, we can go into some of the other stories which are associated to this, but I uh, wanted to share just something about the aspects of the particular, this item um, that is mentioned in something that Lewis Ginsburg had written. And he is the father, I mean, the, the one that wrote the Legends of the Jews. And interestingly, he wrote an article about this particular item and elaborated upon the this particular rod and it also makes mention of Aaron's but um just to share a little bit to give people an idea uh about it and what is found in the traditions of to of this particular item it says um it was made of sapphire and weighed 40 sias or it was like 10.7 pounds. It bore the inscription of the names of you know, Yore Vadhe and the initials of what are said to be the 10 plagues. Uh, legend has still more to say concerning this rod that God created it in the twilight of the sixth day of creation. 
and delivered it to Adam when the latter was driven from paradise after it had passed through the hands of Shem, Enoch, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob successively, it came into the possession of Joseph. And on Joseph's death, the Egyptian nobles stole some of his belongings. And among them, Jethro appropriated the staff, which, you know, we'll go into all of that at some point as well. Um, but we'll talk before we get into that in the next show about how and why Esau specifically was hunting Nimrod and that he was trying to gain a return of one of the items, the garments of power, that being stole by Ham was passed on to Cush and then to Nimrod. And that he did, according to the book of Jasher, succeed in the murder of Nimrod and a couple of his king's guard. And that he had uh, that night run to the protection of his grandfather's house. And it was because he was thinking that he was going to be murdered that at that night he sold his birthright um, to his younger brother. And he also for, you know, a bowl of porridge, he was famished. He thought he was going to die. But he also received what is excluded and most people don't know about was the sword of Methuselah, which was a supernatural sword. And that it was by this supernatural weapon that, you know, according to scriptures, that he would live by the sword and die by the sword, that he would uh, be known by this supernatural weapon. And so that was part of the birthright and the story of how he had given it up so easily to uh, Jacob. But um, continuing a little bit more with what it says here. On Joseph's death, the Egyptian nobles stole some of his belongings, and among them Jethro appropriated the staff. Jethro planted the staff in his garden, and when its marvelous virtue was revealed by the fact that nobody could withdraw it from the ground, even to touch it, it was fraught with danger to life. This was because the ineffable name of God was engraved upon it. When Moshe entered Jethro's household, he read the name and by means of it was able to draw up the rod for which service Zipporah, Jethro's daughter, was given to him in marriage. Her father had sworn that she should become the wife of the man who should be able to master the miraculous rod and of no other. It must, however, be remarked that the Mishnah as yet knew nothing of the miraculous creation of Aaron's rod, which is first mentioned in the Mechalitha. This supposed fact of the supernatural origin of the rod explains the statement in the New Testament. Um, it is to be interpreted thus according that Aaron's rod, together with its blossoms and fruit, was preserved in the ark. King Josiah, who foresaw the impending national catastrophe, concealed the ark and its contents, and their whereabouts will remain unknown until in the messianic age the prophet Elijah shall reveal them. But again, as you had mentioned, in these stories it speaks about how these items were passed on and they were used to initiate the later kings, even David. And that um, in the curious story of David and Goliath, uh, it makes mention of a particular staff that he had and that this was part of the battle uh, against Goliath and that um, even the story of Judah and Tamar and how he had given up this staff, the ring, and the mantle, uh, and that these items will return back to um, back to his father, Jacob, after the trial where he was trying to burn um, uh, Tamar for you know having been a prophetess 
but for sleeping with, and it ended up being him, and he was guilty. Uh, and so all that was averted. But anyways, those stories, and then the story of Joseph and Jethro, um, all of that also connects with these items, which we will get into probably in the next ser- um, next show on this series. But it's a, it's a fascinating one. Absolutely fascinating. Certainly is fascinating. I'll be able to read up and catch up. Now, I was so, I'm quite flabbergasted to hear about the staff and the Goliath and David, you know, so I'm looking forward to hear more on that and read up on it beforehand and all these other uh, right. technology that you've given. It is quite amazing. It's a wealth of information that you're providing today that both of you are providing in a chronology, a lot that is uh, new and then other bits that are fitting in. So thank you. You know, it's Welcome. good. It's it is an amazing narrative. I mean, I have to admit, Jen, it's just an absolutely amazing narrative. When you think about that the story of Judah and Tamar, right. you know, he was so far afield at that point. Here he is with that staff, and he's married two Canaanite women, and yes. he's got three sons from these Canaanite women, and Yah is simply not going to allow that bloodline to continue. Exactly. It's like, nope. Forget it. You married the wrong woman, and you should have married this this uh, you know Hebrew girl, and you didn't do it. So now I'm going to make the marriage happen, and he's going to burn her. Was he going to burn her while she was holding the staff in her hand? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, right? Who knows? Who knows right? But right. Uh, but she had she had played it brilliantly, and of course here we see the foreshadow of the woman in the Gospel of John. You know, the Bessera Yochanan, chapter eight. Who is confronted in on in front of Mashiach, and we've caught her in the very act of adultery. Well, how did you yes. catch her in the very act of adultery? Well, she's not married and she's pregnant with twins, right? Mm-hmm. So right. you take a look at right. two things, right? Mm-hmm. And then but Mashiach draws a line, but he takes a finger and draws a line. Was his finger a metaphor for the staff in the hand of Judah? Was that a metaphor right. for the staff of Moshe? You know. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and also in the other, some of the other New Testament apocryphal texts, it elaborates on when he is writing in the sand with his finger that what he was doing was writing down the sins of the Pharisees that they had committed that very same day up until the time that they had come before him to stone this woman. And that reading about their own sins, they left immediately. And so until yeah. nobody was left. So there's, you know, great elaboration and significance to even that portion of the story as well. Yeah. Well, it's it's a beautiful metaphor for us all. And I think, you know, when we talk about this term sapphire, you know, the stick being made of sapphire. In the mm-hmm. sephir, you know, we identify, well, we identify a couple of things that's not found in any other text. One, that Aaron's rod became a dragon. And yes. that the stones upon which the ten Devarim were written were also sapphires. So we spell this C-A-P-H-I-R-E as compared to a sapphire stone, which is later alliterated in the book of Ezekiel, talking about the stones on, you know, the, the, the cherub in, in Ezekiel 28. But when you talk about a sapphire, the sapphire itself means an engraved or etched stone. So it, it, a stone and you etch on it. And in particular, it's a numbered etching. And so with the 10 Devarim, we see a numbered etching. One, thou shall, I am Yahweh Elohim, you shall have no others before me. Two, you shall not uh, 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 create engraved images and bow down to them, th- you know, and so on. So this is why these stones are called sapphires. Now, there is alleged to be the rod of Moshe, supposedly in the Birmingham Museum. But we now have some indication as to uh, what that rod must contain for it to be a bona fide artifact. Now, right. allegedly, it does have the yod he vav carved upon it. But number one, I need to see it to see, is it a paleo Ivrit carving or is it a modern Hebrew carving? You know, is it Aramaic mm-hmm. block script or is right, it the paleo right. script? That's premise number one. Two, 
does it have indication of the 10 plagues of, of Mitzrayim also in Gron? Yes. And then three, is this staff merely of acacia wood, wood or is it engra some engraved stone? And so, again, this is going to be, you know, these are going to be big indicators. And again, these are the kinds of things that you find when, when you look to see somebody says, well, I have an artifact. All right, well, let's take a look and see if it's, in fact, is a true artifact. And uh, so, uh, and then, of course, Aaron's rod, you know, we still don't know the situs of this. And I mean, I have to tell you, Zen, I mean, I'm very excited about the research that we have been doing. And in particular about what took place with Jeremiah leaving Jeremiah and Baruch leaving uh, mm -hmm. the Middle East on a ship with Tia Tefi and about how they yes. were, you know, how they were set a sail and how they, it, there's a, a great book called the book of Tefi that yes. uh, it's a poem. I think I'm sure you've read it, but how beautiful yes. it is. And, it is. And her discussing her arrival. And of course the, the justification is replete in scripture talking about how Jerusalem would be removed and uprooted and replanted elsewhere in the wilderness. And mm -hmm. Jeremiah, I do believe, accomplished this. But what happened in those years be between 581 B.C. when Tia Tefi married Harriman, the king of Ireland, and this became the New Jerusalem at Tara Hill. But New Jerusalem was moved. It was moved. It left that location. And as it left that location, what happened? What does the history actually show? Was there destruction on the land that even came to New Jerusalem a thousand years later at the time of King Arthur II? This again, this would indicate, would show, you know, that New Jerusalem would, would prevail for a thousand years. And then, of course, the, the cosmic events would change history again. So there's things that have happened there that are really indicative of uh, the hand of Yah moving in a huge way because Yah's ultimate purpose is to scatter the children of Yasharel throughout the whole of the world, that the whole of the world hear the gospel of Yahweh, that Yah has anointed me to preach the Bessara unto the captive, to set captives free and to, to plant the trees of righteousness. I mean, you know, I, I just see it uh, as it's when one of the things we discover, Zen, and I think you'll agree with that, I'm going to give you the closing words on this. But one of the things we discover in the extra scriptural writing is that Yah never intended evil for mankind. He intended right. blessing and he intends yes. mercy, and he intends kindness and compassion and redemption and completeness and restoration. And all these things are in his will. And it is only mankind's stubbornness and willfulness and sinfulness and wickedness that pulls us away from his ultimate scheme of redemption for us all. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And it was, uh, it also talks about that, you know, hell was never created initially for man, but it was created as an accommodation for what became the insurgency of the angels and the rebellion against their maker and that um, their fall preceded ours and that the temptation of sin and the waging war for the souls of humanity, the great contest that I uh, speak about and call it, uh, that this is what is taking place in this day and age. And that's why, you know, the whole idea and the concept of we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but these powers, the principalities, the rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places, it's essential that people understand this because we are in this war now uh, and that this will continue and that this war, this spiritual war in heaven is now taking place between the genealogies, the bloodlines of the children of Adam and the children of Cain and will continue until the return the second advent of Messiah. And so understanding this, one knows who the enemy is and also the modus operandi, the strategies of the enemy as it plays out because 
Um, they've been doing the same things over and over and over, over time and generation in order to establish such control. And according to even Nimrod coming to power and establishing the Tower of Babel and the attempt to unify all the people at that time uh, that the tribes and the people were separated in tongue, uh, we know by the story of David and the statue of Nebuchadnezzar that there will be a time where they will succeed uh, and gain control for short time in this manner and that this is part of what will be the reign uh, of the coming reign of the Antichrist and that that whole theme of the New World Order and the agenda of it, it's connected to the Isaiah 14 declaration that um, the son of the morning wants to exalt his throne above the stars and the clouds of God and to be like the most high. And so this is what we see coming upon the world. Yeah, I agree. It's yeah, these are trying times for us all. And yes. we, ha we have to keep in mind, I think, uh, for for all of the believers and all of the remnant that, you know, one, it's really on my heart today to tell people to come out of her, my people. Yes. And we're going to discuss this. Jesse and I are going to discuss this uh, more and more uh, in terms of how to talk about coming out under the common law mm -hmm. and uh, to uh, divorce yourself from the sovereignty of the wickedness of, of Hasatan. It's absolutely critical at this point to do this because the the curses that are coming upon the nations that are uh, have aligned themselves with the dark forces, these curses are coming on the earth now so quickly and so quickly that the remnant must walk away. And, you know, it the the children of righteousness. You know, keep in mind this, that as Job said, though he may yet slay me, still I will praise Yahweh. Yeah. And some of us may survive into the into the thousand year reign. Some of us may not. But I can tell you that if I don't survive, it's okay. May his name be blessed on my lips forever mm -hmm. and ever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yes. and, you know, but when it comes to people that with whom I'm sharing whatever it is that I have, and I know you're doing the same, Zen, is that we share from our heart because the Ruach has put it upon us to share, not for purposes of misleading people or giving people a distortion, but for sharing to for people that they might find the one true Yah, the Elohim, who the creator of heaven and earth, that they might find him and know him and seek him with all of their heart, mind, and soul and come out of this wicked Babylon in which we live. Because yes, if you put a foot in one, that foot is going to burn in a fire. Mm -hmm. If we're half in Babylon, that half is going to burn in a fire. So spiritually, we must come out. And this doesn't mean run away to the woods, but we must come out. Okay. And we are going to be talking about that uh, more and more. I'm going to be sharing more and more on that presentation as we go along. Awesome. Wonderful. You guys, you just, you've both been so wonderful you now in this presentation today. So much food for thought, so much uh, discussion that is new, as well as what you just have to add to. I want to thank you so much. It seems like, so we're in February now, so it's April, May. Goodness. February, March, April, the next time you two are together for the continuation of this on the first Monday it should be of the month will be in April. Um, but, you know, they really love this correlation, what you're doing together. Uh, so thank you. I can't thank you enough. It's just amazing, uh, you know, what you've given us today. I just end with uh, Exodus 17, verses 19 to 30, 9 to 13. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of Elohim in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. 
But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under, and they sat on it, while Aaron and Hur took up the hands, one on each side and on the other side. So his hands were steadily until the growing down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. It's, you know, in the dynamic of what you were talking about, the staff, and to do with Moses as well. Yes. I just wanted to bring that in. Um, absolutely enthralling. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for serving today and investing so much on this platform and together, which is really, really important. Uh, so bless you. Thank you very much. And you thank take you. Care. We will see you shortly. All the Be best. Blessed. Thank you, Zen. Thank you, Dr. Good C. to see you, Dr. P. Yeah, blessings to you, Zen, and all Thank health. You. Okay, brother? You as well. God You're bless. You're precious, Zen. Very, very precious to everyone, all the viewers, Stephen, everybody. You both are. Take care. Thank you. Pray that he's still out there. Somewhere.